Well, welcome, welcome back, my friends. Today here on GB102 Bible Backgrounds, we're going to be discussing the land of Egypt, you know, that superpower to the south and west of Israel. Now, like our Mesopotamian lecture last week, the topic of Egypt is enormous, and so we're going to have to be quite choosy when it comes to what details we choose to tackle here for the next hour. So, for the most part, we will spend our time discussing the times, places, and events that happened in Egypt that will have a direct bearing on how we read the biblical text today. Now, the biblical narratives mention the land of Egypt and various other Egyptians 681 times, proving that Egypt was a constant force to be reckoned with all the way up until the New Testament age. So, in this lecture, we will discuss the importance of Egypt as a breadbasket for numerous empires, which was an agricultural position made possible because of the bounty of the Nile River. Next after that, we will mark up a map uh, of Egypt showing the various locations of numerous points of interest for biblical scholars. And then we will conclude by reviewing some of the major facets of Egyptian history that directly affect the story of the Bible. And we're going to specifically discuss the dates for two important events, the date of Noah's flood and the date of the Exodus. So, if you're ready, let's go exploring that mysterious land known as Egypt. Now today, when we think of the name Egypt, we here in America tend to think of ancient things, that Egypt is one of the oldest things we know. And you know, why not? You know, we've been told since grade school that Egypt is one of the earliest civilizations that we have records for. And we think of old things like pyramids and mummies and, so and things like that when we think of the word Egypt. But it may come as a, as a surprise to you that the name Egypt itself is a fairly modern term. It comes from the Greek word Aegyptos, and from there, it went into the Latin where it became more recognizable to us as Egyptus, and eventually into English, just Egypt. But where the Israelites were concerned, they had a different name for Egypt. They called it Mitzrayim. And this name for Egypt comes from Genesis chapter 10, verse 6, in a list of the sons born to the patriarch Ham, who was the second son of Noah. The Israelites would have drawn several conclusions based on this name, Mitzrayim. The first is that they would have been able to acknowledge that they are not directly related to the Egyptians, save for being able to trace their lineage back all the way to Noah. That's where the family tree forks. And the second conclusion they would have been able to draw is that the Egyptians were an ancient people group with more history than the Israelites had themselves, who only traced their lineage back to Abraham, whereas the Egyptians could trace their lineage all the way back to the son of Noah. Now, while we're talking about naming conventions, the Egyptians called themselves simply the people of the black land. And believe it or not, this is not a designation of skin color, color although they were northern Africans, but this is a designation of the quality of the soil, how it looked. You see, the banks of the Nile River are covered with a rich, black, alluvial soil that has been moved downstream from areas like Sudan, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And so, the soil is some of the most fertile agricultural material in the world, even today, and it allowed Egypt to become an agricultural superpower, in addition to being a militaristic superpower. And what this will mean for our class is that most large worldwide empires, such as the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and even the Romans, will all want to specifically conquer Egypt because they'll want to cash in on the grain and other agricultural products that can be produced there. In fact, the Romans actually imported so much grain from Egypt that they ran ships from Alexandria to Rome and back again all 12 months of the year, even though this kind of a run was extremely dangerous during the winter months. So, simply put, Egypt was the bread basket of the ancient world, and the climate was just so that a farmer could expect to grow two, sometimes three, full crops every year. And this agricultural output is unheard of in most places in the world, even today, including the United States, which has a comparatively short growing season. Egypt's growing season lasts pretty much all year, except for when the Nile is in flood stage. And so you may be asking yourself, so why is Egypt so special? 
After all, the land of Mesopotamia also had some pretty rich alluvial soils because of their major rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Well, the answer for why Egypt is special even among these early civilizations is that the Nile River is consistent. It floods every year. In fact, it floods in such a predictable way that the river itself was worshipped as a life-sustaining god. And the pharaoh, or the king of Egypt, was also worshipped as a god because he was believed to be instrumental in this process of making the Nile flood every year. Or, if I could put it another way, because the river was so consistent, it made it easy for others, particularly the pharaoh, to claim that it was because of their power that the river was flooding and that the land was producing such a bountiful harvest. Well, today, the native Egyptians call themselves the Copts, or the Coptic people, and they share a modern-day country, also known as Egypt, with a people group known as the Arabs. And usually this term Copt, or Coptic, is reserved for specifically Christians who live in Egypt. And to this day, they still refer to themselves as the Coptic, or Egyptian Orthodox Church. So, another important point that I want you to take home about Egypt is that without the Nile River, this entire land would have been overtaken by the Sahara Desert millennia ago. Notice on the satellite image that we have on the right-hand side of this slide. You can see a small, thin, green lifeline pulsing through the center of this image, with light, tan, barren areas directly to the east and west of that line. That little curvy line is the Nile River. And what this means is that the land of Egypt is not very wide. Sometimes it's only two miles wide or even less. The land gets, its, gets just as wide as the river can flood. Or it gets as wide as the people are willing to dig irrigation ditches from the river. So, Egypt is quite long, though, as opposed to wide. The... Egypt runs the entire length of the Nile River until you reach a series of waterfalls, which are known as cataracts. And so keep this in mind, that the river hydrology, the river water conservation of this area, allows the place to be much more productive than a place that is powered simply by rain and other rain-based agricultural ideas. So both Egypt and Mesopotamian cultures will become worldwide powers by virtue of the possibilities allotted by rivers. And it explains why Egypt becomes so powerful, and places like the Phoenicians, the Israelites, or the uh, Philistines will not be as powerful. They simply don't have a river feeding their lifeline. So that's our basic view of Egypt. So go ahead and pause the video for a moment and download the Egyptian thumbnail map from the LMS. You may also want to take a moment to view the video here of Egypt's timeline to get a few more ideas of how you could do your timeline project. And as always, I'll let the map do some singing while you do the downloading. Well, hopefully you've got your map downloaded and it looks something like this. So let's begin by noting the scale bar that's down in the lower left corner. Notice that the scale of this map is much larger than the scale of our Levant maps that we've been doing lately, but it's slightly smaller than the scale of our Mesopotamia map. So. Like always, you're going to want to get your crayons or your markers out because we've got a lot to cover on this map. So let's start with the blue marker and note the major bodies of water. Let's start in the north. In the north end of this map, we find the Mediterranean Sea. The ocean currents of this sea and the prevailing winds largely kept invaders from the north and from the east at bay. Only people like the Romans or the Libyans, who had the luxury of sailing from west to east, could reach Egypt easily by boat. From there, let's move to the east. To the east and the south, we see a large body of water that looks like a peace sign, or a uh, body of water that's making the letter V in American Sign Language. This body of water is known as the Red Sea. And you notice where the sea divides into two parts there. 
uh, in the northern section. Uh, these parts can be further distinguished as the Gulf of Suez, there the western finger, and the Gulf of Aqaba, there to the east. And you may be asking, is that a misspelling? Because the word Aqaba comes from a Semitic language. It has no rules about the letter Q and the letter U following together as a pair. So this will be one of the few times where you see a word where the letter Q stands all by its lonesome. Okay, moving to the north from the Red Sea, we see in the northeast corner of the map a small, tiny blue lake. That is the Dead Sea, and we've already marked it on our Mesopotamian map, so we can see where these maps have a little bit of overlap. So those are the five major bodies of water. The Mediterranean Sea, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Suez, the Gulf of Aqaba, and the Dead Sea. So let's keep that blue marker out, and let's mark the rivers. Well, let's mark the river. In Egypt, there's really only one major river worth noting, and that's the Nile. At 4,258 miles long, the Nile River is the longest river in the world, and more than a thousand miles of its course runs through the land of Egypt. So, notice here that the north end of the Nile, where it drains into the Mediterranean Sea, it begins splitting into small rivers, making a D or sorry, making a V or a triangle shape. This area of the Nile River is known as the Delta, or the land of Goshen. And this name Delta comes from the Greek letter named Delta, because in Greek, the letter for D or Delta looks like a triangle. So also notice that at the southern end of the map, that our river has three little hash marks. Each of these marks represents a cataract, or a waterfall. These waterfalls blocked river travel going both north and south, and what this did was it provides Egypt with a naturally occurring and easily defendable border with the Ethiopians, or the Cushites, to the south. So notice the Mediterranean Sea largely kept people from the north at bay, where the cataracts kept people from the south at bay, isolating Egypt as it were. So go ahead and pause your video here and mark the map as I've done here. So next, let's pull out the green marker and let's note some of the major regions of Egypt. You see, unlike Mesopotamia, which was home to numerous competing people groups, Egypt's geography largely allowed the land to remain isolated and homogenous. You really only find Egyptians in the land of Egypt. And so let's begin by marking this green delta area. This area is the widest and most fertile area of Egypt, and many major cities are going to spring up because of the available space and access to water. The major Old Testament cities of this area are Giza, not to be confused with Gaza, which is a Philistine city. Ramses and Pithom are also two major Old Testament cities that will be built up using Israelite slave labor. Now, in the New Testament era, there's going to be another delta city known as Alexandria. It was established by Alexander the Great in 332 BC, and by the time of Jesus, it will be the second largest city in the world. And the city that also supported the largest Jewish population anywhere outside, anywhere including Jerusalem. So, keep this in mind, that during the New Testament era, more Jews lived outside of the land of the Levant than inside it. And specifically, the Jewish population of Alexandria was even larger than the Jewish population in the capital city of Jerusalem. So go ahead and pause the video here and mark the Delta region and all of the cities that I've got marked. So now the next area we want to mark is Lower Egypt. And Lower Egypt is technically the area all the way from the Delta to the city of Thebes. This entire area is known as Lower Egypt. And for years, this designation has confused students because this area is further north on the map than Upper Egypt is. And so the trick to remembering this is that Lower Egypt is a designation of elevation, not of geographical topography. You see, rivers flow downstream, and so the area that is closest to the mouth of the river is the lower part while the areas that are up in the hills where the river comes from is the upper part. So get your red marker out and let's mark Lower Egypt from the cities of Memphis to the city of Thebes. Now, in 
The Old Testament era, cities on this part of the map are Memphis, Abydos, and El Marna. In the New Testament era, the city of Abydos will be known as Nag Hammadi, which became a center for a heretical group of Christians known as the Gnostics. Now, another New Testament era city, Oxricus, is a city that uh, housed a treasure trove of early Christian writings, including some of the earliest known Christian hymns. So go ahead and mark the map as we have here. Mark the cities of Memphis, Abydos or Nag Hammadi, El Marna, and Oxricus. Now, down to the southern end of the map, we find the land of Upper Egypt. And again, this is a designation of elevation. It is more hilly and mountainous in Upper Egypt than in Lower Egypt. So, go ahead and pause the video here and mark this area in purple as I have shown. Now, the Old Testament era cities of Upper Egypt are Thebes and Aswan. But by the New Testament era, a group of Jewish people living near Elephantine Island in the middle of the Nile River... Uh, will start a city known as uh, as Elephantine. And so they, what they will do here is these Jewish people will build a competing temple that is seemingly is in direct violation of Deuteronomy 12.5. And also note here at Aswan, we have the first of the three cataracts. Note the three hash marks and mark those as cataracts number one, two, and three going from north to south. Okay, so let's shift gears here and let's mark some of the deserts and mountains. The most important area for the study of the Old Testament is this area known as the Sinai Desert. I have pictured in brown here. On the southern tip of this rocky and barren peninsula is a mountain known as Jabal Musa, which is Arabic for the Mountain of Moses. This is the traditional location of Mount Sinai that the Israelites will journey to in the book of Exodus. Also note that at the eastern edge of this desert, we have two major cities from maps we've already seen. Gaza, which is a city of the Philistine Pentapolis, and another city called Kadesh Barnea. We'll specifically look at this in the next lecture uh, on the land of Judea. So go ahead and pause your video here and mark the Sinai Desert as well as marking the traditional site of Mount Sinai, Jabal Musa. So, it's at this point that I hope you have a lot of brown or yellow crayon left because the entire eastern end of this map is known as the Libyan Desert. Some people also would refer to it as the Sahara Desert. And this is a vast and near impenetrable land, by land for land travel at least, and the only way to cross it is to take a well-stocked camel caravan and zigzag across it going from oasis to oasis and this desert constituted Egyptians, Egypt's, Egypt's western border, and it largely kept them safe from attacks from other North African groups, such as the Libyans, the Carthaginians, and the Cyrenians. Now, to the east of Egypt, guess what we find? Yep, still more desert. When Moses led the exiting Israelites into this desert, they eventually reached the Red Sea. Now, most scholars actually figure that they crossed at the Gulf of Suez, since in the book of Exodus, the account says that they crossed over in towards a site known as Baal Zephon, which we know today is on the east coast side of the Gulf of Suez. So, go ahead and pause the video here and mark the eastern desert as I have shown. This is Egypt's eastern border, and it largely keeps people from Palestine, Arabia, and the Sinai Peninsula from easily accessing parts of Egypt. And so finally, let's mark the Arabian Desert. This desert formed the southern and eastern border of the Levant, and this may very well have been the land where the Israelites wandered for 40 years, as described in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. Hmm, well, yeah, there's not really much more to say about this. This is a desert area after all. But we will cover this area in a little bit more detail in later lectures when we discuss the lands of the Negev and the Wadi Arava. Okay, so there you go. We finished marking our map, and it should look something like I have pictured here on the slide. So, if you've got all that, let's leave off this map here for another day, and let's shift some gears again, and let's talk about Egyptian history. Particularly, let's talk about the parts of Egyptian history that intersect with the biblical narratives. Alright, so like I noted at the beginning of our lecture, 
Egyptian history is huge. And we could easily have an entire class just to talk about Egypt, and we'd probably still not even scratch the surface. So, in order to organize all the possible data we could discuss, let us um, use the age system that is common to Egyptology. And the first Egyptian age is known as the Old Kingdom. And it lasts from approximately 3100 BC all the way to 2200 BC. Now, most historians use this as an approximate date, 3100 BC, and they use it to mark the event where the first pharaoh, a guy named Narmer, united Upper and Lower Egypt and established the first dynasty. And what a dynasty is is just simply that you have parent to son to son to son, and as long as that line remains unbroken, you have a dynasty. Egypt will have a total of 31 dynasties. And what this will mean for Egyptian culture is that as it emerges, it is emerging at the same time that Mesopotamian culture is emerging, sometime between 31, 3200 BC. So, for most historians, the Old Kingdom is the golden age of Egyptian history. And many of the massive landmarks known as pyramids and other major temples are constructed during this era. And the first of these pyramids was built by a pharaoh named Dozer, who died around the year 2670 BC. And so impressive were these pyramids, not just to other travelers, but to the Egyptians themselves, that they honored the designer of the first pyramid, a royal uh, advisor or a vizier to Dozer named Imhotep. And they, they honored him so much that they deified him and treated him as a god. So keep this in mind that Egypt is already an ancient culture by the time Abraham arrives on the scene. By Genesis 12, when Abraham shows up approximately at 2100 BC, Egypt is already 1,000 years old. And so just to give you some perspective, the pyramids would have been as old to Abraham as the Jamestown colony would be to us today here in America. So, the greatest of the pyramids that were constructed in Egypt were constructed during the 4th dynasty. And the greatest of all the pyramids was the Pyramid of Khufu. And it's located in the site of Giza, which we've already been locating on our thumbnail map. Now, it's nearly impossible to do justice to the size and the scope of these buildings with mere words, but since I can't afford to take you all to Egypt myself, words are going to have to do. So, picture this. The base of Khufu's pyramid is 13 square acres. Its height is 481 feet tall when it was completed. And the individual blocks in this pyramid each weighed several tons. And there's about two and a half million of these blocks. That's the same as having two and a half million cars. And these blocks were quarried from several miles away and had to be shipped down the Nile River on boats. Also, note that in this picture that there are three main pyramids at Giza, and all of them are massive. The second largest pyramid, built by the pharaoh Khafre, is the best preserved pyramid and temple complex, and it also sports the Great Sphinx, and damaged as it may be, this sphinx stands near the entrance of a very long processional causeway that linked the pyramid with its temple. And there, over to the right side of the picture, that's the smallest pyramid, and it's built by a pharaoh named Minkari. And while this pyramid is only 204 feet high, that's still equal to a 20-story skyscraper. So keep in mind that even the smallest of the pyramids that were built at Giza are still imposing structures even by today's building standards. So you may all be wondering, okay, where does this data of the old kingdom of Egypt meet up with the Bible story? Well, my students, the time has come for you to find out about one of the more complex issues in all of biblical studies. How do we assign a date to the flood of Noah? You see, according to Genesis chapter 11, verses 10 through 26, there should be 292 years between the time of the flood and the birth of Abraham. And if we go with the traditional date for Abraham's birth in 2166 BC, this means that the flood would have happened about 24, 2458 BC. And simply put, the chronologies of both Egypt and Mesopotamian history do not show so much as a hiccup during this time frame. 
And what we would expect to see in response to a worldwide cataclysm, the kind of cataclysm where only eight human beings survived, that we would expect to see written records to be few in number, and that those written records would be located in one or two small areas. And this would be the case for at least a hundred years or so until those eight people could repopulate the world and spread out. And historically speaking, this just is not the case we see in the year 2458 BC in Egypt's Old Kingdom. It's still going strong. And the same could be said in Mesopotamia, where the Akkadians are just starting to rise to power and challenge the Sumerians for dominance. So, what do we make of all this? Well, the simple answer is that it's complicated. And there's no such thing as scholarly agreement on when the flood happened. Now, I am in agreement with scholars like uh, Arnold and Beyer that this is a matter of interpretation, not inspiration. That we don't have to assume that the Bible is clearly wrong or, or fallible, but that the problem lies in how do we interpret this set of scripture. And so with all that in mind, let's look at the three major theories on how to interpret the scripture. The first is the small flood theory. It says that the flood was small in scope and it only wiped out a small people group. And in fact, it didn't even touch the cultures of Egypt and Mesopotamia. The strength of this theory is that it allows for a mathematically accurate chronology. And it can also account for why Egypt and Mesopotamia continue on business as usual without even so much as noticing Noah and his flood. But the weakness of this theory, of course, is that it's hard to reconcile God's statement that he said he was going to wipe out all of humanity from the face of the earth, according to Genesis 6.13. Okay, so our second theory is this, that the flood is a worldwide flood, but it's much more ancient, sometime before 3300 BC, before the dawn of written records that we have accessible today. And the strength of this theory is that it takes seriously the destruction of humanity by the flood and that this flood could even cover the highest mountains. See Genesis 7:19. But the weakness is that we have a 292-year chronology in Genesis 11, and that means that there must either be gaps in generations, there's just certain names we just didn't listen, or it means that the author didn't mean for us to take this chronology literally. So the third theory is a theory that states that both the scope of the flood, that it was worldwide and total, and that the date of it, around 2458 BC, are both correct. And the problem is we've got Egyptian and Mesopotamian histories all screwed up. Well, personally, I find this theory to be somewhat of a long shot, and simply because we would expect to see if we destroyed all of humanity down to eight people we would expect to see almost all written records to vanish. And we would expect to see pagan culture get a severe reorientation because they'd remember a flood punished them for their wickedness. And we'd remember things like Noah. We would remember things like the flood. We would remember things like Mount Ararat. And simply put, this isn't on the radar anywhere in the ancient world, at least enough to corroborate the Genesis evidence. And so... There really is no proof that all of this happened anywhere between 3,300 BC and 2,200 BC. And so, simply put, I find the third theory to be quite a long shot. And so, you may be asking, well, what's my opinion then? Which one do I like? Well, I like the second theory the most, and here's why. Much of the work on ancient chronologies, biblical or otherwise, suggests that gaps in the data are common. And I believe Genesis 11, 10 through 26 is an example of this. And theologically speaking, if I had to pick one of these two to be taken metaphorically or figuratively, the flood or the Abraham chronology, I'd have to go with the Abraham chronology. There's just not as much theologically writing on it. If I could put this another way, if you were to add dozens of grandparents to Abraham's genealogy, you don't change much theologically. But if you say that the flood isn't worldwide or universal, you have to change your theology on dozens of other Bible stories. So, for the record, let me just say this. I personally believe that the flood was universal and worldwide, but I believe it happened before 3300 BC. 
that we have this large flood that wipes out most records and fully reorients the cultures that come after it. So now, after 2200 BC, the Old Kingdom will end, and Egypt will go through a series of very weak monarchs. So weak, in fact, that the lands of Upper and Egypt will be divided by civil war, and will have nearly constant conflict with each other. And just to show how bad this situation was, there is a king list that was found in the city of Abydos. It's a city we've already marked on our thumbnail map. And this king list makes a joke that in the capital city of Memphis, 70 different kings reigned for 70 different days. Or if I could put this bluntly, being a pharaoh during this time probably meant that you were going to be assassinated quickly and someone would be trying to take your place. I also find it notable that during this time, Abraham goes to Egypt, according to Genesis 12, 10 through 20, and he tells his wife, Sarah, to lie about their relationship. And Sarah is to tell people that she's only his sister. And you may have been puzzled, why is Abraham doing this? Why is he afraid of the Egyptians? Why does he think the Egyptians are such a lawless people that they're going to kill him and try to steal his wife? Well, my theory on this is that the first intermediate period is just a very unstable time, and people are kind of have a habit of killing each other and usurping power left and right. Here comes Abraham. His wife Sarah, the name literally means princess, is coming down to Egypt. He knows it's a lawless time. He knows that people are going to find his wife attractive and possibly with a name like princess could be thinking this is a way to political power. And acting on human wisdom, he plans accordingly. He plans wrong, but he does plan accordingly. So now, at the turn of the millennium, Egypt regained a certain amount of stability. And when the pharaohs came to power during this time, and they consolidated both Upper and Lower Egypt back under their power, this is the beginning of what we could call the Middle Kingdom. And most Bible scholars assert that it's during this time that best fits what we see in the later chapters of Genesis, the tales of Jacob and his son Joseph in particular. And so using the timeline that I showed you earlier during the first week of class, I think it's fair to say that the pharaoh Senussert III is the ruler of Egypt during the time when Joseph predicted the seven years of plenty, followed by the seven years of terrible drought. The ages match up with the timeline that we see from Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph. And his reign is long enough that you could have a pharaoh who could have seen both the good years and the bad years and confirmed that Joseph really was a person who understood the signs that God was showing him. But then, at the end of this Middle Kingdom period, starting around 1700 BC and lasting all the way until 1540 BC, Egypt was invaded by a people group that they called the Hyksos. And so, if you were ever curious, why did the Egyptians suddenly seem to just turn on the Israelites and make them slaves at the beginning of the book of Exodus? Well, the answer could very well be that this new people group came in, and they'd never even heard of Joseph. They didn't speak Egyptian, so they couldn't read the old records. And this may fit what we see in Exodus uh, chapter 1, verse 8, where it says that a king arose who did not know Joseph. And interestingly, it calls him a king and not a pharaoh, which could be indicative of the Hyksos conquering the land of Goshen and Lower Egypt. And it's also notable, at least to me, that the Hyksos came from the area of Asia, and specifically, they seem to have migrated from the Levant itself. And this may have helped to convince the native Egyptians that all of these people who are migrating from the Levant are nothing but trouble. And so, when the Egyptians finally do rebel, and they kick the Hyksos out in 1540, they may have just been inclined to see all foreigners as bad, and to treat anyone from the Levant with contempt, and this would include the Israelites. This also may explain why the Pharaoh of Exodus chapter 1 verse 10 is afraid that the Israelites will ally with the enemies of Egypt. Simply put, I don't think they're trusting foreigners from the Levant after 150 years of rule by the Hyksos. So, the Hyksos period drew to a close when a Pharaoh by the name of Amos was 
able to reunite Upper and Lower Egypt and then drive the Hyksos back into the Levant. Now, as best we can tell, Amos is probably the pharaoh who started the policy of destroying the Israelite boys by having them thrown into the Nile River. So, if my timeline and my calculations are correct, this is probably our best guess for the time period when Moses was born. Also, just coincidentally, there is a female pharaoh who will come after Amos by the name of Hatshepsut, and she will rule between 1479 and 1458 BC. And she is frequently suggested by scholars that she could be the daughter of the pharaoh who pulls Moses out of the Nile River and raises him as her own son. And this is a conjecture, I admit. It's very inconclusive, but it does agree fairly well with the chronology of 1 Kings 6.1 that supports this idea that Moses lives approximately in the time of the 1440s when he's leading this exodus. Also, it's interesting to me that the name Moses in Hebrew is pronounced Moshe, and this is very similar to some of these Egyptian names that we're going to see. Amos, and one of his descendants will be named Tutmos, and then we also have the name from Moses, Moshe. And so, in short, the name that Moses receives from the daughter of Pharaoh is very similar linguistically to the names of other royal Egyptians at this time, and this is what inclines me to place Moses at this time period during our timeline. And so now you may be asking, when exactly was the Exodus, and what was the Pharaoh who experienced Moses and Moses' God bringing the ten plagues upon Egypt? Well, if we go with this conservative date of 1446 BC, that dubious honor of Pharaoh of the Exodus would go to Tutmos III, who was Hepshetsuit's biological son. Now, there's a few other factors that point to this as being the pharaoh of the Exodus, and one of those is that Tutmos's firstborn son, a kid named Amenhat, died young and didn't get to become pharaoh, and this could be fitting the consequence of the tenth plague, where the firstborn of every Egyptian household, including pharaoh's household, died. Additionally, Tutmos III's son, who does take the throne, a, a kid named Amenhotep the second, once he comes to power, he needs to take over 100,000 slaves with his military expeditions in order to basically fix a slave shortage that Egypt is experiencing around 1425. And this would fit what we see in the Exodus, that thousands, if not millions, of Israelites are leaving the land of Egypt and Amenhotep II basically says, where am I going to get more slaves to do the labor that we need to get done? But it's not as cut and dry as this, however. There are a few problems with asserting with 100% certainty that Tutmos III is the pharaoh of the Exodus. The first of these problems is that Tutmos III is an extremely powerful king, probably the most powerful king of this early New Kingdom period. And he's going to fight wars in the Levant from 1446 all the way to the end of his reign in 1425. So if I could put this this way, the pharaoh, if he is the pharaoh of the Exodus, the events of the Exodus did not cripple his political or his military power. And I find that to be somewhat ominous because, quite frankly, the story of the Exodus says that Moses trounces the pharaoh and basically decimates Egypt. And Quite frankly, Tutmos doesn't seem to have too much hurting his political power the entire length of his reign. And secondly, all of the records we have from Tutmos's reign, from an Egyptian perspective, are very positive, and we don't see a description of a major slave uprising until the time period of his son. So, if he is the pharaoh of the Exodus, his court scribes did a very good job keeping all of these events secret out of the Egyptian history books. So, I know for me, I personally believe that this is the pharaoh of the Exodus. I think the best data points in this direction, and it overcomes some of the questions. But again, I don't think I can be 100% certain either. And because of that, I should probably tell you about a few other contenders that come up from time to time when discussing who is the pharaoh of the Exodus. 
So one of the more enigmatic pharaohs of the New Kingdom period is this ruler named Amenhotep IV, and he will officially change his name to Akhenaten when he becomes pharaoh. Now, this ruler will do something that no other pharaoh in Egyptian history will try. He will dismiss all of the traditional gods of the Egyptian pantheon, and he will follow a practice that is known as henotheism. Now, this is where a polytheist will pick one god in their pantheon, and they will exalt that god to such a high place that the other gods just might as well not exist. It's not technically monotheism, but it's pretty close. And for me, this fits the kind of experience that I would expect in the wake of the Exodus, that the Israelites, their god, and the ten plagues on Egypt just decimated the land. And clearly Akhenaten has lost his faith in these traditional gods of Egypt, which is what I would expect to see after Moses basically gives Egypt and their gods a good thrashing. And so Akhenaten may be remembering that one guy called Moses, and he may be trying to figure things out on his own. He's probably gasping at straws here. Um, he knows he should be worshipping only one god, but since Moses isn't there to tell him more about his god, he's trying to piece it together for himself. And so what Akhenaten will do he, is he will begin worshipping the sun disk, known as Aten, exclusively. Now, I don't think Akhenaten is the pharaoh of the Exodus, but the weird events of his reign compel me to speculate that he is probably in some way remembering Moses, and Moses is God very well, and trying to adjust his religion to fit that experience. Another interesting parallel is that Akhenaten will establish a new capital city, El Armana, and we have dozens of letters that survive in the royal archive from El, in El Armana that originated from the Levant. These are letters that came to Egypt from the Levant. And many of these letters are calls for help. That the people there in the Levant are saying that there's this warlike people group coming in known as the Hapiru. And that they are attacking cities in the Levant, and they are specifically asking Egypt for military aid. And this fits what we expect to find in the time after the Exodus, when Joshua is leading the people into the Levant, and he's attacking Canaanite cities and claiming the land as Israel's inheritance. It's also notable to me that the word Hapiru could be just a mispronunciation of the word Hebrew. And it's further notable to me that Akhenaten seems to do absolutely nothing in response to these letters. And this may further indicate that he is remembering the royal trouncing that the Egyptians received at the hands of the Israelites and their god, and he doesn't want to risk another defeat. So now, the last king of the New Kingdom period that is seriously suggested as possibly being the pharaoh of the Exodus is this pharaoh known as Ramses II, or otherwise known as Ramses the Great. Now, this pharaoh reigns for 66 years, and he built many impressive cities with slave labor, including the cities of P. Ramses, and this could very well be the city of Ramses that is described in Exodus chapter 1, verse 11. Now, like Tutmos III, Ramses' firstborn son will die young, causing many people to suspect that this is the son who dies in the 10th plague. But this may be just more of a problem than the fact that Ramses II lives so long. In fact, he will live such a long life that he will outlive his first 13 children. And it's only his 14th son, Merenephtha, who will take the throne. And he'll take the throne when he's about age 50, indicating that Ramses may just simply have outlived most of his firstborn sons. But I will note that many conservative scholars, including the great Christian Egyptologist K.A. Kitchen, will assert emphatically that Ramses II must be the pharaoh of the Exodus. So, while I don't find the evidence as compelling as the evidence for Tutmos III, I have to admit that quite a few heavy hitters in the field of biblical studies do find the evidence pretty compelling. So, 
If you want to learn more about the problem of placing a solid date on the Exodus, I strongly recommend K.A. Kitchen's book on the reliability of the Old Testament. It's an excellent scholarly introduction to all of the considerations that you got to take into account before you can assign a date to the Exodus. To be honest, I've only had an hour for this lecture and I was just able to scratch the surface. So if this kind of a thing intrigues you, good luck and I hope you find it as fulfilling as I have to do the legwork in this kind of study. So finally, in 1208 BC, during the reign of Merenephtha, we finally get solid archaeological evidence that the Israelites are living in the land of the Levant. And we know this because Pharaoh Merenephtha left a monument that describes all the people groups that he went to war with during his 1208 BC campaign. And among these people groups, he says he went to war with a people that he calls the Sons of Israel. Now, this monument, which is known as the Merenephtha Stela, is the oldest piece of archaeological evidence that we have outside of the Bible claiming to say anything about the existence of Israel as a people group. And it's also helpful because it gives us the latest possible date that the Exodus could have been, sometime around 1270 BC. This will give Israel time to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and then take most of Joshua's lifetime to conquer the Levant's central ridge, where Maranatha will fight them in 1208. So, that's the high and the low of the New Kingdom period. Most of the events of the Exodus happen sometime between this 1550 BC and this 1100 BC time frame. So then, the New Kingdom period will end with the arrival of another invading people group, and the Egyptians just simply called this people group the Sea Peoples. Now, the Sea Peoples were a warlike group that began causing all kinds of havoc in Egypt around the year 1189 BC, and after a few years of warfare, the Egyptians will successfully push the Sea People out of Egypt, and the Sea People will take up residence in the Levant. Specifically, they'll settle in the Philistine Plain. And so today, scholars kind of question and argue if the Sea People just, they are the Philistines, or though some, some, some will ask, did the Philistines already live there, and the Sea People just simply moved into the same land and started intermarrying so that the Sea Peoples basically gave the Philistines their technology. Well, regardless, with the arrival of the Sea Peoples here around 1200, the Bronze Age will come to an end, because the Sea People will be one of the first people groups that we see using iron weapons and armor in the battlefield. And this does fit very well with what we're going to see in 1 Samuel 13, verse 20, where the Philistines have cornered the market on iron weapons, and they're trying to keep iron out of the hands of the Israelites. And so if the Israelites want to have anything like a plow or something that's made of iron, they have to take it all the way down to Philistine territory to get it sharpened and to get it worked on. And so in this way, what we see here at the end of the New Kingdom period is the beginning of the Iron Age. And Egypt will go into a period of decline here. They will never really rise to the level of world power that they did in the previous millennium. But this does not mean that Egypt was harmless, however. Many times, Egypt will rise to cause some severe problems in the land of Palestine, and several pharaohs will assert their military might in the Levant over and over again. And one of the most notorious events along these lines happened in the year 923 BC, when a pharaoh named Shoshunk, also known in the Bible as Shishak, invaded the southern kingdom of Judah and took quite a bit of gold as plunder. In fact, he will enter into the temple of Judah and will take the golden shields that Solomon had made to decorate the walls. And some of this gold still exists in the form of archaeological artifacts. For example, here in this slide we have the golden funeral mask of Shoshunk, and this may very well have been gold that at one time resided in Israel's temple. 
And the final pharaoh that we need to discuss that directly affected the Bible story is this pharaoh known as Necho II. Necho is probably most infamous for killing the last of Israel's good kings, the king Josiah. And after Josiah's death, the kingdom of Judah will only have evil and wicked kings until the Babylonians conquered the city of Jerusalem in 586 BC. But Necho's story doesn't end there. Necho will be largely responsible for making sure it didn't happen to Israel sooner. You see, after slaying Josiah, Necho would team up with the declining Assyrian Empire, and they will decide to make their last stand at the city of Carchemish in 605 BC. Now, this battle will go very poorly for the Assyrians and the Egyptians, and Necho will withdraw from heavy losses after the battle, and eventually the Babylonians will conquer all of Egypt and add it to their empire by the 560s. But Necho is pretty much the last independent pharaoh. After this, the Babylonians will encroach and eventually conquer Egypt, and other world empires will continue to do the same for centuries after that. So from this point on, Egypt is largely reduced to just being a province in these world empires. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and even the Romans will all conquer Egypt, and they'll conquer them because it's an important piece of real estate. If you want to feed an empire, if you want to feed soldiers, you need the agricultural possibilities that the Nile River could provide. And so, long story short, after 525 BC, Egypt will no longer rise to be a world-class military power. They will only be an important agricultural world power. So, with all of this in mind, what can we say in conclusion about Egypt to wrap this whole lecture up and tie it off with a pretty little bow? Well, firstly, let's say that Egypt's story intersects with the Old Testament biblical narratives at nearly every point. As an ancient culture, they were a force to be reckoned with by the time Abraham arrives on the scene, and even in their twilight years of decline in the years after 1200 BC, they still had the military and the political power to make life rough for people that lived in the Levant, and this includes the Israelites. Secondly, as an agricultural power, Egypt was a prime target for conquerors who needed vast food resources to keep their armies fed and their empires growing. And lastly, Egypt's relationship with Israel is complex. It's sometimes tempting to simply say Egypt was always the bad guy. And it's true, for the most of the part, Egypt and Israel will be enemies. But Sometimes, like for example when Solomon married the daughter of Pharaoh, they will become temporary allies. But what is crucial to keep in mind is that the Exodus event dominated the worldview of the Israelites. This is their defining moment, and Israel and Egypt or sorry, and Egypt plays a major role in this. And because of this, if anybody really wants to seriously study the Bible at an academic level, it's become kind of expected that they will know a lot about Egyptian history and culture as well, just simply because it will help you see the nuances and the detail in the biblical text of when are they addressing concerns about, is, about Egypt, when are they co addressing concerns about Egyptian military, Egypt, Egyptian religion, the Egyptian culture. And so knowing about Egypt is always going to be a helpful thing when you read your Bible. So, that's it, my friends. May God bless you for all your hard work and attention. Study hard this week, and we'll meet again for our next lecture when we discuss the land of Judah.